In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so this is the lecture for Friday, May 6, 2020, and this will be the last lecture for the course this semester. The last lecture offered online and the last reading assignment that you will be responsible for for the final exam. And the topic for today is the last things what theology usually refers to as eschatology. Eschatology, just referring to the culmination of history, what everything amounts to and leads to in the end. On the title site here, I pasted an icon of the Last Judgment, a Byzantine icon of the Last Judgment, which kind of encapsulates all of the topics we have a chasm at the bottom, chasm between heaven and hell. You have Christ, the righteous judge, at the top in the middle. And then you have a portrayal of division between those who go to Christ's left into the mouth of that uh, monster at the bottom. Presumably that is a portrayal of hell of Satan. You even see little demons pulling people down on what looks like a river of lava. And then on the left, at the bottom, you have a summation of salvation history, and then all of the figures in the icon depicted with halos are a depiction of those who are in heaven with God. Notice uh, you have Mary, the mother of God, portrayed a couple times. She occupies a privileged position in heaven. The old man at the bottom with the cloth full of what look like little heads, little children, this is meant to be Abraham. In the Old Testament, you may remember that God promises Abraham to uh, make him a great nation to make his descendants as numerous as the stars and there's a phrase in the Bible that refers to death called uh, returning to the bosom of Abraham and then you have uh, Peter and Paul opening the doors to Eden and it's a good uh, portrayal of the last judgment you even have all creation included in it with all the creatures there you see on the right. Okay, so the four aspects of eschatology, the four last things in the Christian faith are death, judgment, heaven, and hell. So it's really about what lies beyond this life, but even more broadly, it's what this life amounts to. What is the ultimate culmination of creation, of human existence, of the whole process of redemption. And the best way to get into it, I think, is to reflect upon our own identity. So who are we? If you look in the mirror, ask yourself, who are you? Is there really an answer to this question? And if there is, are we the only ones who can provide that answer? What is our life really about? Who am I? What am I for? What is the purpose of my life? We talked last time about the possibility that someone else could know who we are even better than ourselves. Is this our responsibility to know and understand who we ourselves are? Or is there some other reference point that can truly reveal who we are? And related to this, 
specifically related to the topic of death, judgment, and heaven and hell. Is there a difference between my present self and my true self? Who I am now and who I am called to be? Or is my identity completely and wholly determined by my present characteristics, my present circumstances, the acts that I have performed to this point in my life? And the last things, the Christian understanding of these last things really is premised upon a piece of good news about the human person and human identity. And the good news is there's more to you than who you are right now. So you often hear almost as a consolation, you are just the way you need to be right now. While there can be something that is reassuring about that in the short term, but it can be really depressing if you think about it too deeply and apply it to the long term because that means, well, there's no way forward. There's no uh, potential to be realized from this point. However, I think what it's really getting at, that phrase, you are just the way you need to be right now, you are who God intends you to be, is that from God's perspective, he sees you as you are. What he sees in you is not just the developing, unfolding, partially realized being that we all happen to be at the present moment, but what you could be, what you are called to be. What he sees in you is your complete self. What God sees is beautiful, unique and irreplaceable because you are a beautiful unique and irreplaceable reflection of himself so god knows our true identity god knows who we really are and the primary point of divergence for who we will become particularly in the next life is whether or not we accept this true identity and allow it to emerge or whether we reject and repress it. This is fundamentally what separates salvation from damnation. Do we insist upon being what we are not, or are we able to accept who we are and see the goodness of it and then allow that goodness to unfold over time? This is kind of what Himes is getting at when he says that salvation is about accepting the goodness of being human. It's about accepting our particular place in creation, accepting who God made us to be and allowing that identity to unfold rather than insisting upon being something that we're not. And most of all, insisting that we determine ourselves who and what we are. This places us in God's uh, place and it basically is what prevents us from becoming that beautiful unique and irreplaceable creature God made us to be. A French poet of the 20th century Leon Blois once said that there is really only one tragedy in the end not to have been a saint. There's really only one ultimate category of human failure and that's not to have been the holy creature that God made us to be. Everything else falls under that catch-all category. Not living up to who God made us to be and not achieving what God intended us to achieve. There's an interesting, almost curious passage in the second chapter of Revelation where God speaks to the just who are in his presence and he says that he will give them a white stone and upon the white stone is written a new name that only that person knows revealed only to that person it's a name that's only between God and each individual person 
that dwells in his presence. I find it very beautiful because our parents give us our name. We acquire these marks of identity from other people in the world as well as experiences we have in the world, achievements we may accomplish in the world. But it's really God who knows our true identity. It's only God who really knows our true name. And in heaven, we discover what that name is. So this is a process, it's a journey to find out who we are, but the answer is out there. The truth of who we are is out there and it's God who knows it. Okay, so we can apply this line of questioning then not just to ourselves and our own identity, but to all of existence. We can begin by saying, well, does my existence have a point? Do I exist for a reason? Edward Shree mentions at the beginning of his chapter on the last things, chapter 9, this uh, almost funny Roman epitaph written on a, a Roman grave. Uh, I was not, I was, I am not, I care not. Non fui, fui, non sum, non curo. It's sort of openly nihilistic. It's sort of uh, looking the insignificance of human existence right in the face and saying, oh, there was a time that I didn't exist. I existed, don't exist anymore. Who cares? And if that's really true, then this changes the landscape of the world for us. Right? We live in a world in which we just happen to be around for a little while and then we're gone and then we're forgotten and then who cares? Everything is kind of pointless. Now, in contrast, the tombs of the early Christians included epitaphs, included images that expressed hope hope for an ultimate meaning of the person's life and an ultimate fulfillment of the person beyond this life. But really, the question comes down to whether our lives mean anything in the end. And there's either an answer to this question that is in the affirmative or an answer in the negative. But there is an answer. It either is the case or is not the case that our lives mean anything in the end. And the answer to this question has a significant impact on how we live here and now. I would venture to say that all of us behave as if our lives have some sort of meaning. It's very difficult to live in the world in which anything you do ultimately has no meaning, no matter how attenuated, provisional, or immediate that meaning is. We act as though what we do has some significance. It's very hard to live as a complete and consistent nihilist. But what determines this meaning? Is it our actions? Our impact upon the world? Our relationships? What's the point of reference that we're using to judge whether our lives mean anything in the end? Is it whether or not we ultimately get a Wikipedia page, whether or not we have a Nobel Prize or some sort of lasting accomplishment? Is it the memories that we leave behind in those we love and the succeeding generations of those that are related to us? What are we using to determine whether our lives have meaning or not? Well, regardless of our standards, our criteria for determining the meaning of our lives, if we presume that our lives have some meaning, we instantiate this meaning by how we live our life. We, in a sense, write the story of our lives. And those stories can be the products merely of our own creation. They can have co-authors, whether it be God or other people. We can allow other people to determine the progression development and ultimate meaning of this story. But the story unfolds with each successive moment. 
that we live. We're constantly playing out this story of our life at every moment with every thought, every word, every action. We're contributing another component, another part of this story. And we do so in a way that's irrevocable. We write the story of our lives in ink. We can't go back and erase things that we have done, said, or thought. Our lives, in a sense, are sort of an unstoppable force that's progressing continually through time. Some of us just allow it to happen. Some of us try to take more control over it than others. But we live out our lives, and it ultimately culminates in some sort of story about who we were, what we did, what characterizes our time here. And so what we do ultimately makes us who we are. And to get a sense of this, you could just read the obituary sections in the newspaper. What do people choose to include about the life of the person who has passed away? What do they want people, even people that may not have known that person, to know about their lives? And then you could think about your own obituary. What do you want people to know about you after your life is completed? Okay, well, this is a kind of preliminary then to the topic of judgment. What is judgment? Judgment is basically the final revelation of who we are and what our lives amount to, what the true meaning of our life has been. Christians believe that there comes a point where we find out who we really are and all the masks come off. Our lives are uncovered for what they are, and they're presented before God and given their kind of definitive evaluation. So Christians believe that every person ultimately at some point stands before God alone, unadorned, without any accessories or props. You can't bring a lawyer to you at the divine judgment. It's just you, and there's no spin. It's the no spin zone where you stand before God as you really are and all the filters are removed and God sees you for who you are and you see yourself for who you are. And it's here where the whole story of our life is in a sense read out and where a meaning is revealed of our whole lives taken together. Many people who come close to death have this experience of their whole life flashing before their eyes. This is a kind of anticipation of judgment. The story has been completed, so what's the point of it? What's the meaning of it? What does it all amount to? And judgment also includes the aspect of justice, which is unsurprising because judgment often is associated with uh, legal proceedings in which people seek out justice. But it's here that God ultimately answers, responds to everything that happens in a person's life. But one way of getting at the idea of justice isn't so much that God gets final revenge, but that God finally takes account of and properly responds to everything that happens on earth that may not have received a definitive response. Every little thing comes to light. And this kind of uh, squares with the idea that things have to have some sort of resolution. Otherwise, we sort of live in an arbitrary and power-dominated world. What about all of the people in the world that have died unjust deaths at the hands of others? Others who may have never gotten caught. What about all the lives of the millions of people who have been exterminated in genocide? Can we really answer for those? Can we really make those kinds of things right in the end? Or are there things that only God can really properly respond to and make right? Jesus himself gestures at this 
reality when in the Gospel of Luke he says, There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops. So judgment is the final revelation of all the secrets, of all the things we keep hidden and repressed in us. We come face to face with who we are and what our lives have been. And so it's no coincidence that Christians have often seen this as something of a fearful possibility and that they have taught its right to be somewhat afraid of facing who we really are. You have the experience even of hearing yourself recorded. When I listen to these lectures, I'm like, is that really is that really what I sound like? You may have had that same experience. You hear your own voice recorded and you say, is that really me? Is that really what I sound like? Judgment is something similar where you find out who you are and we have this intuition that we probably are going to be somewhat surprised. And maybe it's maybe it'll be a good surprise. You have uh, in Matthew 25 the experience of the people who helped the poor. And they said, well, I didn't realize that I was actually helping you. Uh, wow, I was actually uh, doing something better than I thought I was doing. But in any case, it will be something that will involve revelation. The first of the last things upon which everything else is premised is death. So there's a transition going on in these last things, and the transition is death. And we might think of this transition in terms of a kind of birth. So Christians believe that life does not end at death, that death marks a kind of transition, and it's a transition into a completely different reality, like the transition involved with birth. Think about this. I mean, if you were fully cognizant and aware of your surroundings in the womb, what could you possibly know about the world outside the womb? You might be able to hear sounds, you might be able to feel things like heartbeat. Uh, babies in the womb can open their eyes, they can move their fingers, they can even pick their nose or try to pick their nose actually. There's footage of this. But could they know what a color is? It's completely dark. Could they know what it would mean to breathe? Could they know what a flower is? Could they possibly conceive, even in the smallest way, what their mother is and that they're actually inside of their mother? Well, any figments that even the most cognizant and aware baby could have would be completely uh, not worth comparing to what the actual reality of the world would be. And so this is a kind of useful analogy for thinking about the next life and even thinking about the world itself, our present life as a kind of womb. The next life is going to be as different from this one as the womb is different from the outside world. And so there's a certain humility that Christians need to keep in mind about thinking what the next life will be like. There will be new dimensions of this reality. So we live in space and time, and all of our experience are they're conditioned by the fact that we live within space and time. But throughout the Christian tradition, it's almost uh, unanimous that death will lead us beyond these confines, and even the resurrected Jesus himself did not seem bound by space and time. What would it be like to live in a reality that does not include these limitations of only being in one place at one time, only experiencing one moment and then the next in isolation from one another? So the word or the concept that Christians use to think about this new reality is eternal life. So it's life, it's a continuation of our identity. But one point where I would disagree with Shreve is that he says the soul is immortal, it lives forever. Well, we're destined for eternal life, but not because there's some essentially immortal part of us. 
only God is truly eternal. Only God truly exists and lives beyond time and space. We ourselves are mortal creatures. Now, it's true that in the drama of Eden, in the third chapter of Genesis, God does not seem to initially will our death. How can we know this? Well, death comes as a punishment. It would be strange to say, I'm going to punish you by making you have to endure something that you were destined to endure anyway. But Christians have often thought that the preservation from death that was a condition of original justice, so the original condition of Adam and Eve before the fall, is something that is extraordinary. It's a grace. It's God who sustains Adam and Eve in this way. It's God who gives them this life, this protection from death. And death comes as the result of sin, but it's really just a capitulation to our natural state of mortal creatures. God removes himself, or rather we remove ourselves from God, and so we remove ourselves from the source of life, and so we're consigned to endure death like any other creature. And so in light of this, it's important to appreciate that life beyond death isn't something that we're owed. It is a gift. It's something brought about by God himself. So... God is, just like creation, always involved in this process. We're sustained after death by God's grace just as much as we're sustained during life by God's grace. So what is eternal life then? It's really about accepting the invitation to share in the life of God himself. So it isn't just sort of um, the shape that our natural immortality takes. It's our response to this freely given invitation that God has to share in his own way of being, which is eternal and which is characterized by love. Okay, well, in light of that general idea of what eternal life is, then, what do we do with hell? What is hell? Well, hell is basically just the refusal of God's gift of eternal life. And it's the culmination of the sin that was the original cause of death. So what was the first sin, the sin of Adam and Eve? They wanted to take for themselves this fruit that would make them like God. Now, as we read in the rest of the Bible, it was God's intention all along to draw us to himself, to make us like him. In fact, he created us in his image and likeness. And so there's a sense in which we already were a reflection of God, but this likeness to God was meant to unfold and grow. It was meant to be a gift to us. And the real sin is presuming to claim this gift for one's own. No, it's not something that you're giving me. It's something that I'm taking for myself. It's not a freely given act of love. It's something that I've earned, something that I've achieved. Now, to claim eternal life as something that is owed to one, claiming to be the source of life, the source of one's own life, what determines you know, the good and evil in one's life, this is really the pathway to hell. It's living in permanent conflict with the reality that we can't change, the reality that all of our life is a gift, a gift of love, and that we're ultimately called to live in relation to God, live in relation to others, and so to, in a sense, be dependent upon others and not to occupy the place of God in determining what's good and evil for oneself, uh, presuming to create the meaning of one's own life. But we can persist in this attitude that we ourselves should be God. We ourselves should determine what is good and evil. And we can take it to the end. It's, hell is really about choosing to reign even in misery rather than serving in ecstasy. The motto of Satan and all the fallen angels is non servium, meaning I will not serve. 
and um, you know, in, in Milton's Paradise Lost, uh, this motto manifests itself, expresses itself as uh, to better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. This really gets at the, the fundamental choice that's being made by somebody who ends up in hell, that they would rather be their own God in a state of contradiction and misery and conflict than to have the humility to accept the role of creature, of servant in heaven, a place that is characterized by happiness and joy. So hell is really about our refusal of God's love. It's a choice that we make. The door to hell, as it is said, is locked from the inside, not from the outside. Hell is a state that we can only choose for ourselves. But why doesn't this just lead to our annihilation? If God's love is the reason we exist in the first place, God's love is what sustains us in being, isn't to refuse God's love, to refuse being, to refuse existence? Why wouldn't this manifest itself as just annihilation, ceasing to exist? And the premise behind the Christian affirmation that hell is a state that people continue to be in after this life is that refusing God's love doesn't nullify God's love. God still loves us, even in this condition. God's love still sustains us, even in hell. It's just that we refuse to embrace that love. So our eternal destiny really hinges upon our capacity for love. God's love is eternal. It's the ultimate reality. And it marks every creature that it brings into existence. And the mark of God's love upon us is something indelible. But unlike creatures who don't have freedom, who don't really have the capacity to choose whether to embrace or reject this love, part of this mark of God's love upon us is our own acceptance or rejection of it. So you might even think of it like uh, a tattoo or a permanent mark of a kiss. And that can either be something that causes you joy or something that causes you misery, reminds you of your dependence. So heaven is the fulfillment of our capacity for communion, for interpersonal communion. And that means that hell is really the fulfillment of our own desire to be alone, to exist independently and not to need other people and especially not to need God. Okay, so a little bit more on how heaven and hell compare. One thing we need to really get straight from the beginning, though, is that we don't really go to heaven and hell. This is our way of often speaking. After you die, you go to heaven or hell. And it's often been conceived in spatial ways, like you go up to heaven or you go down to hell. In fact, that Greek word for hell, Hades, uh, was thought to be an actual place under the earth. So you descend into hell. It's beneath you. It's below you. And heaven is above you. But we need to get beyond the kind of spatial conceptualization of heaven and hell. As Pope Benedict XVI says in his article, heaven and hell are not cosmographical destinations. They're not places out there that you get transported to after death, right? Because that would just import the dimension of space into this new reality. Heaven and hell are rather states of being. How do we understand this? Well, we even have phrases that kind of gesture towards this in our own language. You could say that there's such a thing as being in love or such a thing as being in pain. Heaven is just really the state of fulfilled love. Heaven marks a kind of state that embraces your whole self, characterizes your whole existence. It isn't just the place you happen to find yourself. Hell then would be the state of absolute loneliness or isolation. And what that means is that heaven and hell begin here. They aren't things that start to manifest themselves after we die. 
we develop our capacity to love even in this life. I love this analogy that um, I got from Bishop Fulton Sheen, public uh, Catholic figure from a few decades ago. He says that heaven is to a good life like an oak tree is to an acorn. What does he mean by that? Oftentimes, even Christians think of heaven as an extrinsic reward. Like you win the swimming race and then you get a trophy. But the trophy really doesn't have any integral relationship to the swimming itself. It's just something that's meant to signify your success at this activity. You know, maybe getting a trophy for a trophy making contest might be a little closer to it. But an acorn is related to an oak tree as a kind of natural outgrowth. So heaven is the natural outgrowth of a good life. And we have glimpses of heaven and hell here. Um, the person who feels completely fulfilled by a relationship of love, who is enthralled by the love of God in their life. In a way, they're already experiencing a glimpse of heaven. Those who feel, who feel utterly alone and abandoned are experiencing a foretaste of hell. So the present life is a prelude to the next. And those who find themselves in heaven will find themselves coming to the fulfillment of the sort of life that they have been leading all along. And likewise, those who find themselves in hell will basically see the condition of the next life as the final culmination of the sort of existence that they've been leading up to that point. So in a way, heaven and hell characterize the whole of our existence. Those in heaven will look back and say, this was heaven all along. And those in hell were basically saying, uh, there has been nothing except hell my whole life. All right, so heaven is really about being completely enthralled by God. Eternal life is nothing but the participation in the eternal activity of God's love. And love is an ecstatic activity, meaning it's something that draws you out of yourself. And those of you who have had this experience of being enthralled by something, of experiencing ecstasy, uh, may recognize the, the dimensions of, of heaven and the, and the um, resemblance to the experience of love in these experiences. You're drawn to something that completely captivates you. A lover is just utterly enthralled with a beloved, maybe to the point where he or she doesn't even think about themselves anymore. Their whole world is now uh, bound up with the object of their love. Their own life doesn't matter as much anymore. And so in heaven, we are eternally drawn outside of ourselves. This word ecstasy is, is a nice term here because it comes from two Greek words, ex, E-X, meaning out of, and stasis, meaning a kind of equilibrium. I mean, we even use that word in English today, stasis, meaning a state of stable existence. So we usually find ourselves occupying our own space, our own life, our own consciousness. But then there are moments where we're drawn out of this, where we're enthralled by something beyond us and we forget about ourselves. Well, this is what heaven is like. It is ecstatic in this sense. And Aquinas and others in the tradition will refer to heaven as the beatific vision. So we see something that makes us happy. We see something that completely captivates our attention, draws us outside of ourselves. And at the extreme, it completes us. We see God and everything else kind of falls into place. And in this experience, we, we lose ourselves in it. We're no longer focused in upon ourselves. And we also lose track of time. We have these sort of anticipatory experiences in this life and they're instructive because when you're really enthralled in something, say you're just completely absorbed by a game of basketball, uh, it's very easy to lose track of the time. Right? Time operates differently than, say, when you're in a really boring class and the seconds just seem to tick away more and more slowly 
and time draws attention to yourself and then you look at your watch and you look at your watch when will this be over when will this be over those moments of greatest happiness when you are really drawn out of yourself time has the opposite effect where did those four hours go uh, time dissolves into the background and you have there a sort of intimation of immortality of of eternity where there is no time there's just this eternal everlasting now and the now the moment in which you're enthralled is all that matters so this points us to an important insight from the christian tradition that heaven is not boring uh, the images of heaven that often appear in the media or in cartoons of just floating up into the clouds in a white robe and playing a harp all day long that would get tiring after a while right like after the first 10,000 years of just sitting there on the cloud strumming a harp going to church constantly uh, that, that doesn't seem too attractive and some people would say uh, I'd rather go to hell because it's probably more interesting down there there are more fights and uh, there's at least things to occupy my attention but this is a misunderstanding of heaven heaven is dynamic in heaven we are eternally drawn out of ourselves which means we're eternally taken in by things that are ever new at each moment heaven is the most interesting uh, state of being one could find oneself in because it involves eternal growth what captivates you what draws you into itself is something that has no end so there's always something new to discover about it there's always something more to grow into heaven is also centripetal in its dynamic meaning the force is always drawing you inward to a common center it's a dynamic of convergence of union so you're there together with others and you're drawing closer and closer to a single point you're interpenetrating more and more your communion grows and grows it's it's a force of unity as opposed to hell which is a centrifugal kind of dynamic if it's premised upon aversion of wanting to be alone wanting to stand uh, by oneself uh, as god of the little fiefdom that one is carved out then it's going to continually flee from a common center so if being alone is what got you into hell then the natural dynamic of hell is to grow further and further apart from others from god the loneliness only grows just as in heaven the love and fulfillment only grows and really if you think about it uh, the ultimate state of boredom would just to be stuck by yourself forever just to be stuck inside your own head forever and have nothing to look at except yourself nothing to occupy you except what you yourself claim to be your own okay so what do we do then with this category of purgatory this is um mainly a catholic category for uh, life after death but it is one of the four last things death judgment heaven and hell because it's part of heaven really purgatory is just the recognition that a our lives prepare us for heaven but b this preparation often remains incomplete so what do we do with that you know conjunction of, of premises uh, we need to prepare ourselves for heaven, but oftentimes our lives can be cut short. Uh, perhaps we haven't uh, continually grown in a linear fashion toward heaven. And so what do we do with this remainder in us that is not prepared to receive the love of God? Well, Catholics at least believe that this preparation for heaven can continue even after this life. So it's a profound reflection of hope hope for people who may be imperfect and yet who may be rightly oriented to God at their deepest most fundamental level accept the love of God and want to be with him and happy forever with him and God takes these people and completes them God makes us ready to share his life fully by purifying us and healing us of whatever limits our capacity to love. This is really the only true disability in life, a limitation on our capacity to love. And it's in purgatory where we are, we're healed of this, 
and we're made capable of entering God's presence fully. If God's love is a real thing and participation is something real and not just a kind of uh, participation trophy, then we have to be made ready, we have to be made worthy to enter into this activity. Now this process of purification can be painful, but it's ultimately liberating. It has a purpose. You know, pain without an evident purpose can sometimes be intolerable, but if you know exactly why you're experiencing this pain, if you can see the ultimate goal uh, that is in sight, then it can be endurable. I love the phrase of Meister Eckhart with regard to purgatory, that if it is a process of being refined by the fire of God's love, only the no burns. Only the part of you that says no to God, that says no to your own creatureliness, is what burns away. But this isn't part of you in the first place, not a part of your true self anyway. The image from the Old Testament, which gets picked up in the New Testament as well, is a refiner's fire. So one who refines metal in order to make objects, like a blacksmith, purifies the metal of the pieces that don't belong, and makes the metal whole and pure. And how does a refiner know whether the metal is truly purified? Well, the old test is you can see your reflection in it. It kind of fits beautifully with this idea that God purifies us because God purifies only what obscures his reflection in us. So after this process of purification, God looks at us and sees a clear reflection of himself that unique, irreplaceable aspect of himself that we were created to reflect. And in this process, nothing is truly lost. It's really about healing the gaps, healing the wounds in us, and making us whole. Those parts of us that we may have thought were essential to who we are, when they burn away, we'll see that they were really holding back our true identity. And so, in this purgatory, we become our true selves. We are made whole, and all of us is made whole. I just want to briefly touch upon here this part of the Apostles' Creed that says we believe in the resurrection of the body. An easiest way to understand this is that if we are redeemed, if we are raised up again to life beyond this life, then all of us is redeemed. All of us is raised up, including our bodies. So we are made whole, but all of us is made whole. Our bodies are not just sort of incidental to who we are. They're not just wrappers for our true self. And so Christians have believed that heaven involves somehow, mysteriously, somehow involves the body as well. St. Paul says we... Um, don spiritual bodies, whatever that means. Bodies that are not limited by time and space in the way that we are here, but are nevertheless reflections in who we are, manifestations of our identity. And, you know, the only really reliable analogy here is the body of Christ, who, when he's raised up again, is not limited by time and space, but is still fully bodily. And he eats broiled fish with his friends on the lake shore. Okay, so in conclusion, the Christian account of the last things is really just about the reason we exist and the ultimate culmination of the point of our existence. This was nicely captured in the first question that Catholics of previous generations learned when they learned their Baltimore Catechism. Why did God make me? This is the first question that uh, Catholics and CCD had to uh, answer and the correct answer is to know him to love him and to serve him in this life and to be happy with him forever in the next so it's ultimately a very hopeful uplifting answer because we are made for happiness we are made to be happy and we're given the key to that happiness here 
that to know, love, and serve God is really what makes us happy. It's, it's what it means to be happy, to know, love, and serve God. And so happiness can begin in this life, but it is completed in the next, and it lasts forever in the next. So we're not only made to be happy for momentary periods of time here and there, we're made, we're made to be happy forever, definitively, completely, and permanently. And the key, of course, is to unite ourselves to God. And that's what heaven is. Heaven is just being with God. And for Christians, this is the ultimate life goal. So you have various goals in your life. You want to graduate college so that you can get a job. You want to get a job so maybe you can get married, have a family, enjoy your life. You have all these ultimate, you have all these goals that lead to further goals. The question to ask though, is there some overarching goal that you have for your life? What does it all lead to? Why are you doing the things you're doing now? Well, for these other things. But why do you want those things? Well, for things further up the hierarchy. But heaven for Christians is ultimately what we do everything else for. And so if you say, why do you want to go to heaven? There really isn't any, there isn't any uh, further answer to that other than I want to be happy. I want to uh, realize the goal for which I was made. Uh, and so when we're in heaven, there's really nothing else to do. Uh, it is a scene of eternal celebration. It is a kind of eternal party. I like this analogy because when you're at a good party and somebody says, well, what's this party for? You might have an occasion for the party. Oh, well, it's John's birthday today. But you don't really have an extrinsic instrumental reason. Oh, we're holding this party so that, you know, we can put it on our resumes. Or, oh, we're holding this party so that we can raise money. Or, I mean, the best parties are the ones that exist for themselves, for their own sake. And so heaven is a good like that. It's a good to be enjoyed for no other purpose beyond itself. And we find in heaven our true and only home, the place that we truly belong. It's important to remember that because in this life, the world can seem often strange. It can often seem uninhabitable uh, and threatening to us. And Christians have always taught that this life is really a pilgrimage to the next and that we're not really truly at home here. We're just uh, uh, passers through. We're aliens who are residing here for a while, but our true and only home is beyond this life in heaven with God. But nevertheless, heaven can begin here, and we can have glimpses of that true home, even in our current state. Okay, so that's it for this last lecture. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to be able to teach you, and I hope you've been able to get something out of these lectures and out of this course overall this semester. And uh, God bless all of you. I look forward to uh, reading your Christian Lives essays and presentations and to guiding you through the final exam. Uh, I guess that's one last announcement. We will have a final exam review session uh, the last day of classes, Friday, May 15th, and it will be during our regular class time uh, for about an hour. We'll prepare for the final exam. So um, if you need anything, just let me know. But until then, God bless.